Please be seated. Well, good afternoon. I'm Brock Bidlin, Superintendent for the Schools. We wish to wish you a welcome, uh, our honored guests, the home of family, friends, and the distinguished Fearless Falcon Award Ceremony of Fearless High School today. We're going to have the privilege of hearing about the lives, passions, dreams, and goals of three individuals and recognize them for their successes, accomplishments, and the positive impact they've had on others. Will you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance on the plane of the Star Spangled Banner? The Pledge of Allegiance. Today, our first inductee is John Dwyer. John graduated from Fairless High School in 1976. He was a three-year letterman at Fairless and was the last Fairless player to be named All-Federal League in 1974. He held the record for the longest rushing touchdown of 88 yards when Fairless played Akron Hoban in 1975. 
John also held the single-game record of 52 rushing attempts versus Oakwood in 1974. As a two-year letterman in track, his best event was the 100-yard dash. He qualified for districts his junior year and state his senior year. Also, his senior year, he set the school record for accumulated points and running events for the season in the 100, 200, and 400 relay. In addition to all of his athletic accomplishments, John was a member of the National Honor Society. After graduation, John was accepted to the United States Military Academy at West Point. At West Point, John was the third leading rusher and fourth in receptions in both 1976 and 1977. Prior to his junior year, John decided against joining the military, so he transferred to Kent State where he completed his college career. At Kent, he became the co-captain of the 1980 team. He married his wife Leslie in 1995. Later, they had three kids, Grace, Luke, and Jack. Between football, basketball, and baseball, sports played big parts of both Luke and Jack's upbringing. Grace, on the other hand, was more interested in music. John coached his sons in youth football for a total of 10 years and youth baseball for 12. John has spent over 35 years in sales. He is currently self-employed at JL Sales Associates. John is very close with his brothers. He and Mick were always close growing up and have stayed connected over the years, even with the distance between them. Mick is currently battling cancer and they stay in constant contact. Being Irish, they always talked about going to Ireland. In light of where Mick is health-wise, John put together a trip for them in July. They had a great time spending 11 days in Ireland. They drove the entire island and got a chance to go to the open. In his free time, John likes to play golf and downhill ski with his friends from West Point. John also loves to travel with his family, taking two trips each year. He's been to places like Aspen, Cooper Mountain, Breckenridge, and Taos. Congratulations, John Dwyer! Our second inductee is Mr. Gene Fike. As a young kid, Gene Fike attended Navarre schools before they became a part of Fairless. In high school, Gene was involved in many activities. He played football, helped direct the school play, worked on ads for the yearbook, and was a monitor. Next to his senior picture, in the 1953 Navarre High School yearbook, Gene was described as being nice and always good at anything he did. Mr. Fike began his career in education as a teacher at the former Beach City Elementary School. There he taught 5th and 6th grade and later moved on to teach 7th and 8th grade. At Beach City, Mr. Fike coached the football team and the reserve basketball team. In addition to coaching, Mr. Fike drove the bus for both teams. On April 19, 1958, Jean married Velma Hirschberger, and together they had three kids, Brenda, Renee, and Randy. After teaching at Beach City, Mr. Fike moved on to teaching at North Canton Junior High and later became the principal in 1968. In 1975, when Perry opened their new Piper Middle School, Mr. Fike was brought in to be the first principal and later the superintendent at Perry Local Schools. In 1983, The Independent featured an article about the Fikes celebrating landmark anniversaries. Gene and Velma celebrated their 25th while his parents celebrated their 50th. In 1993, Mr. Fike retired from Perry Local Schools where he had served as superintendent for 11 years. Following retirement from Perry, Mr. Fike served as the interim superintendent at Osnaburg Local and Shawsburg School District. He was married to Velma for 61 years. In addition to his three children, he is survived by eight grandchildren and six great-grandchildren. Even at the age of 81, Mr. Fike continued to follow his passion and help kids as the president of the Stark County Board of Education. This is my time of life to give back to the business of education and see how kids grow academically. Jean Fike. Congratulations to the Fike family. Our final inductee is Brett Niver. Brett was born October 4th of 1960. Brett is a son of Millard and Thelma Niver. His parents raised him and his sisters, Denise and Annette, in Canton. 
They moved to an area outside of Navarre in 1970 because his dad wanted more space to garden, have more animals, and keep bees. He credits his mom for showing him how to be helpful to those in need, and his dad for giving him good advice about career and family. Brett was in the sixth grade when they first moved to their home in the Fairless District. He attended Navarre Elementary for one year before heading to Justice Middle School. Later at Fairless High School, Brett was involved in many activities. He was in the band, French club, and even competed on the academic challenge team. Brett was also a part of Mrs. Toot's advanced writing class, where they explored the world of poetry, even getting published in a local journal. Brett also was a member of the track team for three years and the cross country team his senior year. He continued to run after high school, participating in the Columbus Marathon in 1986. Finishing his high school career, Brett traveled to Washington, D.C. with his senior class, which he described as a once-in-a-lifetime experience, as he got to meet President Carter in the Rose Garden. After high school, Brett attended Malone College, where his father was teaching at the time. Here, he played on the soccer team, which began his lifelong love for the sport. Brett credits his interest in computer science to his father, who began the computer science program at the small, liberal Malone College. His father gave him his first computer jobs, upgrading and maintaining computers on campus. In between his time at Malone, he attended Taylor University in Indiana for one semester. Taylor University had a broader computer science program, and Brett's father had a friend there that was willing to help him out. Here, Brett met Admiral Grace Hopper, which he describes as a tremendous honor. Brett graduated from Malone in 1983. He earned a degree in math and computer science. After graduating, he taught at Lake Center Christian School for one year before heading to graduate school at Kent State University. During his graduate work, he was a teaching assistant at Allen Bradley for one year. Then he began working as an instructor and doing side jobs in the computer industry. Although Brett was very busy with his graduate work, he was still in touch with his love for soccer. He even played with the Malone Soccer alumni team. Brett also stayed in touch with his family and friends from Fairless throughout his graduate work. Brett eventually earned his Master's of Science in Computer Science from Kent State University. Throughout his professional career, Brett left his mark on the technological world. He was a senior software engineer at Eastman Kodak, where he developed digital imaging products an engineer and consultant at Diebold, a software department manager at Electric Device Corp., a consultant for Data General, and was a senior manager at Dell EMC. In 2004, he was granted his first of 22 patents that he developed in his career. Brett wrote the software for EMC and also managed a software team. He was involved in system architecture and was one of the drivers behind the VMAX, also known as the Virtual Matrix Architecture, which launched in 2009. That same year, he left EMC and went off on his own. He was awarded the Blackstone Valley Entrepreneur of the Year in 2013. Currently, Brett is the president of Irrigation Automation Systems and is a senior global software manager at Red Hat Incorporated. Congratulations, Brett Niver!
John played football at West Point and made the varsity traveling team as a freshman. I'm going to assume that all of you have heard of the long-standing rivalry game between Army and Navy. John was an integral part of the Army team that beat Navy 17-10 in the 1977 season. John decided to transfer to Kent State to finish the degree and play football, and he worked at Republic Steel as a summer help before starting at Kent. So before I bring John up to the podium, I have a story that I'd like to share that one of his high school friends and classmates shared with me in a conversation recently. John loves clean Indians. So one day at work, this is why I was at the public steel, he stepped outside to listen to the Indians on the radio. Plant security found John and sent him home for the day and told him that he would be required to meet with the plant manager before he returned to work to determine what happened next. Anything ringing a bell, John? Okay. So in that meeting with the plant manager, John was told that he probably would not be returning to work at Republic Steel as summer help. John was asked, what are you attending college, John? And he said, well, I was a student at West Point and now I'm transfer transferring to Kent in the fall. This must have made a very good impression on the plant manager because the manager only gave him one day off and said, you can come back and keep working as a member of our, our plant this summer. So John, congratulations if you join me in front of the podium. Jerseys on the uh, on the video here. 
picture of me in the back here, and I think I had my dad's belt on and pulled my pants up, okay? So we were a little short on equipment. But, you know, really it was just a group of young boys running around an open field, learning a game that we would all eventually come to love. There's a line from a movie that goes, most people don't recognize the most significant moments in their lives when they're actually happening. And I don't think we recognized it at the time, but in a lot of ways, this was our field of dreams. In youth ball, I had my first coach was Joe Stroll. The most memorable one was being what one? AKA Cruiser. He was our hometown coach. He was ready to live right across the field from the uh, from our practice field. My buddy Beaver. At, at, at Hulk Coach, his brother, and uh, our team mascot was Tucker, right? The Jackson. Great memories. So the games were all played at St. Joan of Arc. And uh, we knew four things were going to happen. I mean, it was almost a guarantee when we played this at, at Joan of Arc. Number one, we were a little okay? Number two, uh, most, just about all the calls were going to go against us because most of us on St. Clements were not Catholic, okay? And, I mean, the other thing to do this, that's really not, okay? And there was not a whole lot of, a whole lot of calls that were going our way. And the number three thing after the game, Grant, remember, this is the late 60s, and I think there was only one of these in the area. It wasn't any mass, so none of this was the only one in the camp, but there was a McDonald's. Okay, I would have the field. I mean, literally, I drove by there yesterday. It's like, it's like 100 yards from the, from the field we used to play on. Okay, we were going there after the game. That was, that was a gift. I don't think he's here today, but he should be here. But number four, once we got there, nobody was going to eat more Big Macs than Jimmy Foster. Okay, that just wasn't going to happen. That was number four. That was number three. Okay, Fred, my freshman year in football in 1972. Now you remember back in 72, we did not have junior high, we didn't have it, all of us went one through eight in the bar, Bruce and Big City. So we're coming together really for the first time at freshman year in high school. And needless to say, we really came together now. We went seven and all. Okay, our class did. And we're playing, you know, we're playing Beverly Hills schools. We got Jackson, Louisville, Camden South, we played Walker, we played Faircrest. You know, we're, the point I want to make is our class, one on one with the other federal league classes, we could hold our own. Okay, but a little bit later I'll, I'll get to what, what happened there. Okay, sophomore year, a number of in varsity. I had an opportunity to play in varsity. And, um, I know that they say the mind cannot remember pain. Okay? Well, we went from 7 0 freshman year to 0 and 10 my sophomore year. You can't remember pain? I don't remember anything about that season. <laughs> okay, the one thing I do remember was halftime at North Camp Newark, and we're down 49 to nothing at halftime. Okay? That was, that was rough. So junior year rolls around 19, 1974. We're riding a 19 game losing streak. Okay, we lost that 10 of sophomore year. The year before, first to beat Tussle and open up the season and then lost 93. I didn't know this at the time. I was, you know, doing some research in old uh, newspaper clippings, etc. We won the first two games that year. We beat Tussle, we beat the old Camp Lane. That was the first time in Curlis history that the football team won the first two games of the season. All right? So we're rocking there. We got a two-game winning streak going there. All right? And then the Federal League, then I guess reality set in. Okay, the Federal League uh, schedule started. And um, give me an idea. We had 16 to 14 the first game, 14 to 6. So we scored 30 points. The rest of the season, in eight games, we scored 22 points. Okay? We just didn't score a whole lot. Okay, but we did manage to win two games. Okay, we beat Oakwood, 
we beat Gladwell before they consolidated. The other six games, I just remember the stuff or whatever reason. Marlington, Camp South, Perry Jackson, Hoover, and Louisville. We got shut out in all six. Okay, so the point I want to make there is, is that, again, one on one, class on class, we could hold our own, but we're dressing 35, maybe 40 kids. And you got Jackson carrying those kids 65 to 70. You know, the, just the numbers, the numbers were against us there. So, as Brock mentioned, that was our last year in the Federal League. Okay, we knew that going into the season, we knew that was going to be our last year. And, you know, it was the right thing to do is to move on, is to move on from there. Um, my junior year, you know, I would say would, would be my kind of come, coming out, but it was, it was a good year for me. Um, I was able to stay healthy. Um, Rush for 850 yards. Uh, second lady rusher in the federal league. And I uh, was able to make all federal. And I'm just fitting, I think, that that was our last year in the federal league. Somebody from our team needed to make that. And I was fortunate enough to be that person. That spring went up for track the first time. I think uh, Coach Stiff was saying, hey, you gotta run track, you gotta run track, you gotta run track. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna run track. Um, you know, and at the time, we were talking about this before, uh, a little bit earlier here today. At the time, for whatever reason, track was like the regular stepchild at the Fairless. It was not a real popular sport. Um, I joined the track team, I, I loved it. I loved it. I ran 100 to 200, 4 by 100 relay, uh, long jump. And that year I became first individual to qualify for the district since 1966. Then heading into my senior year, I got an anonymous letter that summer from somebody, I still don't know this day who it came from, but it said, you've been recommended by a friend of West Point as a potential candidate. And, you know, we had no military background at all in the family, and I, I, I knew nothing about West Point. I didn't know even where it was. And, you know, I remember I took a letter in to uh, Dr. Ray Welling, who was like a uh, guidance counselor, and he's like, he goes, man, he goes, nobody from Perils has ever gone, it'd be a great honor. So I started researching it, and um, as Brock mentioned, you got to write your senators, you got to write your congressional representative, you got to get a nomination. And, um, and jumping ahead a little bit here, that nomination came through in October, that later that fall in 1979. And I, I accepted it at that time. Um, Senior year, uh, Dave Dorn was our new head coach. They came in, and Ohio High School rules, you can't have a practice before, I guess, the first. We were trying to get a jump on things because we were installing new offense, and uh, basically we were running a practice. I don't want to say it'll kill the old practice, but it was, <laughs> it was kind of so we're out behind the school here. We're running two plays, and we didn't have uh, no no pads, no helmets. We ran out of a crook set back, the old split backs. Myself and my staff were off. Uh, I'm gonna blame Mike, but I think it was my fault. I think I ran the wrong way, and we collided. Uh, he was about three inches shorter than me. His head hit me on the right side of the face, shattered the drum, shattered the right side of the front. Um, I mean, it really changed my whole senior year. I had uh, I was wired up for nine weeks. Couldn't run, couldn't, couldn't lift, couldn't do anything. Uh, so I got him off the day of Tesla, ironically. I mean, the day of Tesla, we was playing the first game of the season. We beat him two to nothing. Okay. Um, and then I came back after that, but I was so out of shape, and it's just, it was tough. It was really tough kind of getting back and things. So as the, as the season progressed, I could hit the thighs, and I had just a load of contusions in my thighs. And contusions were the, the, the capillary action ruptures. And so I could hardly even bend over. I, there was games I'd miss. I'd take a hit late in the game. I'd be done for uh, the following week. You know, it was a very, very frustrating thing. It was very frustrating. But, you know, again, playoffs for that year, 
our team goal was to make the playoffs. We figured we had to go seven and three to do that. Um, season started out well. We still had to play federal league teams. We had to still play Burlington. We played Jackson. We played the newly formed Glad Oak. And we played them at the old field in the bar. And they were scurrilous. We're dressing 35 to 40. I remember being out for pregame and a bus just started rolling in from Glad Oak. And I mean, it wasn't like a football team was showing up. It was like, a, like an invasion, okay? There's six, I think five or six buses with 20 to 25 picks per bus. There we are, 40 guys on our sidelines. They got 100, at least 120 kids on their sidelines. I mean, that's, you know, you try to spin it then and say, hey, let's go get them, right? But at the same time, they, they can only put a lot on the field just like us, right? So we played on top, you know, we couldn't, we, that's the thing we couldn't do. But, so we sit at three and three, and I think really the special the Oracle game, that was the best game we played as a team the entire season. And um, so we had Oroville and Fulman back to back. We go to we go to Oroville and you know it just it just came together. I I was healthy again, I missed the week before the Jackson and driving rainstorm. Um, yeah, I broke up for 87 yards for a touchdown. Um, I have another one, 52 yard I got tackled on the two, which I can't believe that happened. Um, and the way we ran our offense, Coach Norm and myself, we were talking a few days ago about this. He would normally run me to the right side behind Jimmy, Jimmy Foster and Ken Ryder. And real fitting, you guys are sitting together back there, too. Uh, Peter and uh, Shuggy on the left side. And I think it was the only time the whole year Coach Storm said, okay, let's run him on a straight down over the left side. Worked out pretty good, 87 yards later, okay? So that was, uh, that was a play that we should have ran a little bit more, right? But uh, nonetheless, yeah, that game, I got 179 yards rushing that game. Then the Hoban game at Hoban, um, another game we played well. I, I went one yard further at an 88 yard touchdown that game. And he had 163 yards at the halftime. And that's one game I wish I would have been able to finish. But first, first play of the second half, shot in the thigh. Essentially, my season was over at that point. I just couldn't come back for, for those last two games. Anyway, we, you know, Walsh Jesuit and Mansfield, Ontario, we finished 5 and 5 to not make the playoffs. Track all around the spring. Uh, my goal really was to, I wanted to set the school record in 100, which was 10.05. Last time I had the floor is 10.2. And I really wanted to make it state. Uh, you go to sectional, district, state, made it to the, the district the year before, I really wanted to make it state. And really came down, I uh, ran 10.1 a couple of times, went to sectional, qualified for district, got the district, and it was a format that was really strange. They had three heats of eight, and you take the top two from each heat to the final. So you had six guys in the final, five of which would go to state. So the pressure was really on that semifinal strip, finishing in the top two. We had run, Coach Smith I remember this, we ran an invitational at um, um, up there just north of back, I'm not going to try to blank on the schedule right now. Um, and Hudson, I think I got it. We were in at Hudson. And I didn't run well that day. Uh, there was a couple of kids that beat me. The thing with, with track, at least with me, I wouldn't really always remember the guys that I beat, but I would never forget the guys that beat me. Um, so we got there, and they posted your times coming in. We ran the Ken Rose Bell. There's a kid out of Larry and Greg Jones. He had a 9 9. I'm like, hey, I'm not going to beat him. Okay, I got, I got it for a second. And, you know, we're getting, the neat thing about the 100, you've got eight guys all together, face to face. There's no excuses, okay? If you don't run well, you don't run well. Okay? You can't play well on somebody. All right? And we're getting ready to load the blocks, and I see these two kids from Hudson, and I remember the beat. And they looked at me, and, and I think they recognized me, too. And I'm just like, all right, put up a shot. And I just remember that big difference. Overcast, headwind, which really suited 
suited me well to make that jump as a pretty strong run. Technically, I was, my upper body was messed up, but I mean, I, I kind of, you know, I had a strong run. I mean, head wouldn't normally help me. It wasn't the fastest 100 that I ever ran, but it was probably my best. I almost beat Jones from Illyria. Took second. And I just, you know, not to sound cocky, but I just remember those two kids that beat me at Hudson. The looks on their face afterwards, it was like, yeah, I know what you're thinking, guys, but not today, baby. Okay? And I was able to make it to the final, finished fourth, went to state. Did not run well at state, but I did that. So I think there was time to get ready for West Point. Uh, the retired Lieutenant Colonel, Akron Harry, had us all up there, you know, watching the film, you know, David Light from the West Point did that. And you go there and you think, okay, I got this, I got this, no problems, West Point. You got a report today after uh, July the 5th. Probably the best description of West Point would be a line from Mike Tyson. Of course, Mike Tyson wasn't around for that, but Mike Tyson was like, everybody's got, everybody's got a plan, and then you get punched in the face. That was like walking into West Point. You walk into that first day, they cut your hair, they're screaming at you, everybody's screaming at you, they put you in uncomfortable clothes, you go to bed that night and you say, what the hell did they get myself into? Um, it was, they were denied. I was 17 at the time, and it was, it was that first month, it's, it's kind of survived, it's really kind of survived. Um, they normally start 400 in class, graduate 800. Um, all of a sudden, you show up for a formation and one day, so and so would be gone. Next day, so and so would be gone. These guys are quitting, you know, probably 5 to 10% attrition in those first two months. So, you got to August, and then I was able to start practicing football, which was that was my, that was my recruit, it really was. It was that two, two and a half hours a day when I was able to get away from things and do something that I was very, you know, very, very comfortable with. Uh, head coach there was, uh, was Homer Smith, a guy that I just really respect. Um, Princeton grad, super intelligent, um, former running back. I think he saw in me a little bit of himself, and um, that's not a bad thing. But, you know, you go through practice, and, and then um, season, old, season opens up. Our opener was September 11th. 1976. Mom, Dad, my younger brother Bob, you know, I hadn't seen anybody in two months. Um, They're out for the game. And we're playing Lafayette. Think Ohio State, Cincinnati, okay? You're starting against one of your lesser opponents, okay? You, you want to get that one in. And so we all went out against and I, I really had nothing. I didn't know what to expect as far as any playing time that day. And they go through the first half, we're tied 6 6 at half. Homer Smith, I call him Homer, he was like, a, this, he comes in the locker room and he's like, hey, you guys got, you guys are blocking, you're on tackling, you're on running. He looked around and he goes, Dwyer, get ready, you start the second half. And I'm like, I think I just about passed out. Um, we got the kid off the course, going on the field, get to the huddle. You know, as a running back, you get in the game, the first thing you want to do is you want your hands on the ball, you want to carry the ball, you want to get rid of that tension and anxiety. He calls the play, I know it's to me. I have no idea where I'm going. I mean, I have no idea. I mean, you talk about nervous, I mean, it's like, I'm not, not forget your name nervous, but it's like forget everything else nervous type of thing. And, you know, I go down to my stance, you get a three-point stance, He's falling out of the cadence and right on two again. I just knew exactly where to go. Six yard gain, left tackle, five yard, four yard, three yard. It was just, just right out of the field of one. Scored a go ahead touchdown, won the game. Um, Rush for 68 yards in the second half, and kept the pass receptions for another 30. Uh, it, was, it, it was surreal, to say the least, and it was just. Um, Coming into college ball from high school from girls, um, the thing you always thought I heard was constantly on your mind is, am I going to be good enough? Am I going to be good enough? You just don't know. You just don't know until you get there. And you just got to work hard. That's the only thing that you can do. And obviously, you know, things, things came 
Thanks, Shannon and Gavin. Um, I know I'm rambling there, but it's like a couple of games. One of the real memorable games there was week four against Stanford. Um, I was in the starting lineup that day. After that first week, I started uh, week two. And uh, West Point, uh, Army had played that year before Palo Alto lost 67 to 14. So they come in, they come in the Army, heavily favored. We're down 20 to nothing. Um, momentum is a funny thing in sports. I mean, it's intangible. It's not something you can put your, you can't, you don't know, you don't know how to get it. Sometimes it, you don't know how you lost it. We're down 20 to nothing. We couldn't do anything offensively. All of a sudden, click, we're going down the field. Um, I had a chance to score my first collegiate touchdown on a four yard run. It's 20 to 7. We're going to have Stanford 2013, 2019. We go for two. Watch the other show. We Stanford 21 20. It was, it was a great, great game to be a part of. It really was. Um, Penn State Week 5. Um, Army was just, it was just a, it was a great experience playing football there. Um, you know, the two years that I played, um, I had a chance to start, you know, the majority of the games. Uh, sophomore year, uh, we played uh, Notre Dame. Um, I remember that game going up against a guy named Ross Browner, Browner defensive end. Ross Browner had won the um, Alton Trophy the year before. We played them at the Meadowlands, the old Giants Stadium down in New York. And um, it was cool playing against the Superior Raptors. I mean, you knew when you were up against the we. I had a lot, a lot of that army as a, as a running back, and um, I remember the first time the, the technique on him was the, the tackle that stand him up and you come as a running back and rip his outside leg. First play I did that, I just come right through the guy. Oh, okay, he's you know, I fly through, I'm on the ground, I turn around, I'm thinking, okay, he's going to be on the ground. No, he's standing up. So it's like, okay, this guy's in a different league all of a sudden. Um, Joe Mantiano was the quarterback of that team. Um, did not expect us to do it and, and profess to what he did, but he did. Uh, anyway, long story short, sure with West Point, great, great experience, playing for NFL Hall of Famers, Tony Dorsett, James Lockton, Joe Montana, and Howie Long from Villanova. Um, as the second year progressed in Army, um, the, the, the general consensus there is that second year Army, that's your best year of your life. And I would miserable. Okay, so I'm just like, okay, this probably isn't a real good fit for me. Uh, it just seemed like from a military standpoint, I looked like I got fish out of water. And I just was fighting the system all the time, rather defiant, uh, ragging up the merits. And it's just like, you know, I don't know if this is for me long term. And I would have loved to stay, stay there and play football, but that would have been the right reason to play there. You go there and be a career soldier. In a program with, uh, with West Point, is when you go four years there to college, you graduate the second lieutenant, you put at least a minimum of four years in afterwards and one year in reserve. And I'm 18, 19 years old at the time, thinking, hey, that's nine years of my life. Um, you know, I, I got to figure something else out. I, I just don't see myself doing that. So you can quit any time during your first two years without a commitment. I left that for that second year, came back home to the bar, um, needed to get a job. Went to work at Nichols Bakery or Public Steel. Realized I had some good jobs, but I had to do a little bit more. I need to go back to school. I didn't get my degree. I still wanted to play football. So, um, actually, a coach from Glenelg, coach to Kent, contacted me. I went to Kent. Uh, lost a year of eligibility when I transferred, but I needed to be in school right away. Went to Kent, uh, worked my tail off, and I knew I had one year to play. One year to play when I got there. And at uh, this point in here, injury set in, separated shoulder, pension order, you name it. But, you know, earned respect to the guys there. And uh, in my one year of play, I was named co captain of that team. And that was, to me, it was just, it was just a real, it was a real honor. It was a real honor. Um, ended up graduating in uh, uh, that summer of uh, 81. Uh, interview with the company, but again, the same coach who introduced me to a gentleman that's good here, Tyron Robert. Uh, he didn't have any, oh, it's a disposition uh, for me to guy in the company in Pennsylvania. 
them, went out there, got hired by them. Um, two, two, week, uh, two months there, territory opened up in, in Chicago. I moved there in uh, November of 81. I think I'm going to be here about two years. I'm going to move back home. I'm still out there. Um, but great, great start. Uh, three years of that company. Uh, Company that I call on and sold to, worked for those uh, folks for 16 years in sales, uh, VP of sales. Uh, the company started with 500,000 in sales and went to 20 million. 16 years, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of hard work. A lot of hard work. And then we bought a company um, and a uh, manufacturing facility that was the right thing to do for the wrong company. A year later, we filed Chapter 11. And uh, things just uh, spun out of control at that point. So I'm 42 years old. I'm selling in the, uh, the industry that I've always been involved with in the woodworking industry. I sell various products in the woodworking industry. And it's somewhat commonplace for uh, individuals to become manufacturers called manufacturers representatives. That's, that's what I do today. So I'm 42 at the time. Uh, my wife, Leslie, and myself, uh, we had our uh, dog Grace, who was born in 97. And uh, we had two more uh, looms on its way, and uh, my other one my other to third. And I'm like, you know, I, I, I just need to give us a try. I need to become a manufacturer's rep at, at 42. And she's like, you're absolutely out of your mind. I said, well, you realize that when you marry me, you know. So it's, it's just a continuation. So anyway, I took that leap. Uh, the biggest chance there is it's uh, with health care you know, when you're self-employed. But things worked out well. My networks. Uh, I was able to pick up four or five lines, uh, sell them in Wisconsin, Illinois, Minnesota, Iowa. Um, Twenty years later, uh, I do an annual sales for between twelve and thirteen million dollars a year, and it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. At the same time, you know, it's been it's a lot. It's a lot of hard work as well. Um, Twenty, you know. I know I'm carrying on here, but uh, yeah, I want to give thanks to a lot of people. Uh, number one, I want to thank God, you know, for giving me the ability and the strength to play football and to do the things that I've done, not only on a football field, but also in my professional life. I'd also like to thank God for sending His Son Jesus Christ to be our Savior. Mom, my mom, my mom's here today, 87 years old. Mom, we drug you to a lot of practices, games, man. I tell you, you were, you missed very, very few. For what? For a woman that grew up on a farm and knew very, very little about sports, you became pretty, pretty knowledgeable. Not that you really gave you a, cho a, a choice, my dear. Okay, but yeah, you were there. You were there. Ah, uh, the mile, the mile went really bad. You were 17 months old and then. Your whole life, my whole life, I mean, Trisha, you always seem like you were two feet tall and everything, okay? And uh, you, were a, you, were a, you were a tough act to follow, okay? You really were. But trying to follow you and stay up with you really made me the person that I am. Um, I've always been ultra competitive. And I really hate growing up with you, trying to keep up with you. I didn't have a choice to have to. Honestly, with it. And, um, you know, that's what's really kind of, you know, a big thing that, that really, really shaped my, shaped my life. Yeah, I've been, cha I've, been cha I've been chasing you my whole life. You got inducted two years ago. I'm still chasing you, but I'm two years late, right? So, uh, my brother Bob, Bob, you're a really good football player in, in your own right. And from a wrestling standpoint, I know that when you're years in high school, if you would have had a chance to wrestle, if you were way at 185, I really think that you would have had, you know, an opportunity to go to go to state. My wife Leslie, my family came out here today. Um, that's all football related, I'm shocked with there. Uh, but uh, we, we've been married 24 years. Got uh, three, uh, three great kids. Uh, my daughter Grace. I uh, was born in 1997. She's currently, she graduated from Augustana College of Rock Island, Illinois, this past May. Uh, she's usually a Spanish major. She is teaching English as a second language in high end state right now. Um, she's 
very talented musically, playing the violin and the piano. Uh, just a great guy. My two boys, you saw them on the, uh, the video that went earlier. Uh, Luke and Jack. Uh, Luke just graduated high school back in May. He had a full, uh, full red scholarship in North Dakota State up in Fargo. Um, unfortunately, in August, first week of contact practice, he suffered his fourth concussion and they shut it down. And uh, he's done playing football, unfortunately. Um, my younger son, Jack, is in junior high school. Very talented kid, running back like an old man. Uh, had over 700 yards rushing through six games. He suffered a broken bone about a week ago, and he's going to miss the first playoff game tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, we've had a we've had a we've had a tough go. We've had a tough go there. So. But again, I'd just like to yeah thank everybody for coming out here today. Uh, Right, thanks for, very much for the introduction. I know I'm going to leave a lot of people on it. Uh, the coaches that I've had over the years, Coach Smith, Coach Storm. But thanks very much for coaching. Thanks, for, thanks very much for making me a better athlete. Coaching is a, pretty much a thankless job, it really is. And um, coaching youth ball for the 10 years that I did, um, it really gives you a chance to touch young people's lives. And you guys need to know you did that for me. Very much appreciate that. Boys, great coming back to uh, HS. Thanks very much, student body, for coming out. Thanks everybody for being here. Thanks, for, thanks so much for remembering me. Thank you very much.
He was a calming, calming presence to work with. He had experience and he deal with a lot, he said. But he was always a great leader. He said he often visited Mr. Fight to brainstorm when he had a tough situation. And he was a great coach and a mentor, and we're going to miss him on the educational side tremendously, he said. I've been blessed over the years to have great role models, and Gene is at the top of the list. And, and that's why we have this ceremony, because he was a great role model, and we want you guys to learn and to take something from his life. One of his fellow board members at the county, Mrs. Olson, had a quote too, she said he was a very classy guy. He knew how to handle himself in a board of meeting. He was very fair. And boards of education, you have five people who have very big egos and have ideas about how things should run, and it takes a special person to stay true to their own values and still let everybody else have their say. He was a, he was a great, great man to be able to pull that off and be president of the county board successfully. Throughout his career, whether in the classroom or as an administrator or advisor, he worked to ensure that every student reached his or her highest potential. And while he was an educator at heart, Mr. Chaddock said that Fike was also a family man. He was deeply rooted in his faith and his family, and he lived it, he said. He was very proud of his family, his children, and his grandkids. He lived by God, family, and job in that order. He was a special man. And now, Mr. Fike's younger brother, John, give the family his Perhaps even more than once, 
that's okay too. My brother was an advocate for pursuing what you truly like. Money, titles, and notoriety are not nearly as important to success as the satisfaction of accomplishment in a field that wows your interest. When you select your, your path, you may find the goal difficult to obtain for various reasons. College, for example, is both expensive and selective. We heard John allude to that. Very selective to get to Westbrook. And it can be very expensive, and we heard him allude to that too. He worked to go to Kent State. But keep your goal intact and pursue it with all great determination. Our family, like many, found it difficult to pay college tuition. But Gene found a way to work full time and still attend to graduate from college to pursue his career in education. Many people have done that, and it is something they can translate into great satisfaction when completed. Some of you will pursue your lifelong dream in the labor force or military, and starting as the new guy can't be intimidating and discouraging. But if it is your goal and your chosen dream field, don't ever give up. Go back to your character and your work ethic and demonstrate that you can be successful and that you are tomorrow's leader in your chosen field. Approach life with the attitude that obstacles are made to be conquered. Think about that a minute. Obstacles are made to be conquered. Is that what life's all about? We're all faced with obstacles. We live in the land of opportunity. Pursue your opportunities. Be good citizens. Represent us well. And we will hear from you at these induction ceremonies in the future. You are the players. We are the cheering section. Just to show what passion for your career can do for you, I'm going to leave you with a quote which he used often with his teaching students. Teaching is the profession that creates all others, and he truly lived and believed that. Thank you for your kind attention, and remember to follow your dreams, Farrell Selfless.
mastering the skills that you need to be successful. So, uh, in conclusion, again, I'd like to thank the High School uh, for this honor and also for being very instrumental in the Thank you. Need your attention, folks. 